It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Health. Yesterday, the Minister of Health announced a further expansion of for-profit clinics, sealing the deal for a two-tiered health care system in Ontario. Hospitals all over Ontario are being starved, with funding slashed, deficits rising, and operating rooms left empty. The minister knows the expansion of private clinics is draining resources and staff from our public hospitals. So my question is, is this deliberate? Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. First and foremost, over the last two years, on average, our hospitals have seen a 4% increase in their operating budget. Speaker, for a decade under the Liberals, supported by the NDP, they underfunded the health care system, closing hospitals, closing hospital beds, creating lengthy wait times, firing nurses, and cutting medical school residency spots. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government is making record investments in our health care to provide a system responsive to the needs of Ontarians. Since 2018, Speaker, we've increased our health care budget by 30 per cent, investing $85 billion into our publicly funded health care system this year alone. Speaker, our bold and innovative action has seen Ontario have the shortest wait times for surgeries in Canada, with 80 per cent of all Ontarians now receiving surgery within the target time. I have to stop the clock. I apologize. I have to stop the clock. Member will take her seat, please. It has long been the established practice of this House that members should not use props, signage, or accessories that are intended to express a political message or are likely to cause disorder. This also extends to members' attire where logos, symbols, slogans, and other political messaging are not permitted. This legislature is a forum for debate. And the expectation of the, in the chamber is that political statements should be made during debate rather than through the use of props or symbols. I'm going to ask the member for Hamilton Centre to come to order. I must warn the member for Hamilton Centre. Sarah Jamma, you are named. You must leave the chamber. The member is currently not eligible to be recognized in the House, pursuant to the order of the House adopted October 23, 2023. As a result of being named, the member uh, for the remainder of the day is ineligible to vote on matters before the Assembly, attend and participate in any committee proceedings, use the media studio, and table notices of motion, written questions, and petitions. Start the clock. Uh, I'll recognize the leader. No, we're not doing point of order during question period. I apologize, um, but you have uh, an opportunity to place a supplementary question. I recognize the leader of the opposition. I'd like to ask for unanimous consent, Speaker. 
from the opposite members opposite. I find it, uh, okay, I'm gonna make this a supplementary. I'll, ma I'll make this question to the House Leader. Speaker, this is outrageous that we are seeing one of our members removed from. Yeah, that's not the, the same subject as the original question. <clears throat> Next question then. Question, and I recognize you. So for those who are watching, you'll understand now that I have to continue my question on the issue of health care, but I'll be returning to this issue in my next question. Uh, other provinces have tried private clinics, speaker, have been forced to walk it back as wait times got longer and the quality of care got worse. Opening up more for-profit facilities will mean further, fewer nurses and health care workers for public hospitals where we have emergency rooms and the capacity to do the most complex procedures. Why is this minister ignoring the lessons from BC and Alberta who saw their health systems worsen with privatization? Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. This year, in this year's budget, we invested $743 million into health human resources to be able to stabilize the resources of our hospitals. Speaker, our plan is adding thousands of hours of MRI and CT scans and more procedures, including hip knee replacements closer to home, all accessible with your OHIP card, not your credit card. Our plan has already reduced the surgical backlog to pre-pandemic levels. Speaker, we've added 14,000 additional OHIP covered cataract surgeries annually and added 97,000 MRIs and 116,000 CT operating hours, but we know more needs to be done. That is why we're expanding our community and surgical diagnostic centres to deliver more convenient care closer to home. Thank you very much. The final supplementary. Speaker, people out there, they don't want to see private equity firms and hedge funds running our health care system. It's as simple as that. When businesses which are motivated by profits enter the health care system, it's patients who have to pay the price. We've already seen this happen with cataract surgeries that cost two and three times more in, for, for profit surgical clinics than in the public hospital. Speaker. So back to the Minister of Health. Does the minister like corporations making money off sick people? Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Our government will not tolerate clinics taking advantage of a loophole that was created by the federal legislation. That is why the minister wrote to Minister Holland asking to close that loophole. We will work with our federal counterparts to ensure that that loophole is closed, that people of Ontario are not charged for OHIP insured services. Speaker, the people can always go to protectpublichealthcare.ca and report any instance of being overcharged for our publicly funded health care. Speaker, Ontario will continue to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care when and where the people need it. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. We've already seen a member in this legislature, in this assembly, silenced, which I, I, I think members on our side of the House and the official opposition uh, strongly opposed. Today we are seeing a member removed for wearing uh, a, a sign of her, of her culture and community. I am appalled, appalled, and I think I speak for everyone here on this side of the House, and I actually believe I, I speak for many on the other side of the House as well. Really? Order. Wow, that's interesting. Well, you should tell your Order. Premier. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Will the Premier stand behind his words and compel his caucus to support the freedom to wear cultural attire here at Queen's Park. House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition is, uh, of course, speaking of a member of the caucus, of her caucus, which she removed from her caucus, uh, Mr. Speaker. Having said that, I think the Premier has been very clear on where he stands. It's a decision uh, uh, this, uh, this, that the Speaker uh, has, has, has made. 
uh, Speaker. At the uh, at the same time, uh, Speaker, I, I am quite concerned that the Leader of the Opposition continues to suggest that the members of her caucus or any caucus should be compelled to make a decision. Uh, speaker, that is not the way this place works. I am somewhat concerned that the Leader of the Opposition is suggesting that she's compelling her members to make a decision. Uh, we will continue to follow the rules as established uh, by, this, uh, by this House, Mr. Speaker, until uh, those rules are changed. A supplementary question. Speaker, Ontario is a place where we celebrate different cultures. We work to uphold the values of diversity and we understand the pain that communities feel when they are not represented. We observe Truth and Reconciliation Day to acknowledge the impact of colonial oppression and the erasure at times uh, and criminalization of cultural symbols. I have never seen a government more willing to divide uh, than this government here today. Order. And we've seen it Order. for months and months. Order. At a time when, when we should be bringing people together, they want to remove people. So will the Premier support the freedom of cultural expression and stand with thousands Order. of Ontarians who want to see the reversal of this kafia ban? Speaker, let me be very clear to the Leader of the Opposition. The government does not. The government does not have a ban. That is very clear. And what the leader of the opposition Order. is doing, Order. what the leader of the opposition is Order. doing, is dividing people by suggesting that the government of Ontario has a ban, Mr. Speaker. That is not the case. I will speak very directly to the people of the province. The government of Ontario has not banned anything. In fact, it was this government and this legislature, led by that Minister of Transportation, who in the last parliament— Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Member for Ottawa Centre, come to order. Leader of the Opposition, come to order. Member for Brampton North, come to order. I think there's still some time. Start the clock. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition really ought to be ashamed for what it is that she is doing here today, suggesting to the people of the province of Ontario that the government has made a decision that it has Spons. not done, Mr. Speaker. This is a decision of the Legislative Assembly, Mr. Speaker, and if those rules change, of course, we will follow those rules. Order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Final supplementary. Speaker, I would say to the uh, House Leader that the four, all four leaders of the parties here have agreed and have acknowledged that the ban on wearing the kafia was unnecessarily divisive. The Premier said that he was going to support uh, a motion to erase that. Members of the only people that I heard say no when we had a unanimous consent motion before this House were members of the members opposite, members of this government. Uh, you know, it's not my job to whip their members. I am, I'm going to say I am Absolutely. Again, I'm appalled by this as a member of this assembly. Uh, we have an attempt here again to not only uh, silence a member and remove a member, but we have an attempt by this Question. government to tr try to, to further divide Ontarians. You know, this is, this is really appalling behaviour from this government, Speaker. I don't even know what to say anymore. I wish the Premier was I will say I wish the Premier was here to answer this question. Order. 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 I remind members, all members, that we don't make reference to the absence of any member because on any given day one of us might be not here. As we know. A member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. The member for Niagara West, come to order. Member for Mississauga Lake Shore, come to order. The member for Ottawa Centre, come to order. Start the clock. 
Government House Leader can respond. Uh, look, let me again remind the Leader of the Opposition that the member that she is referencing was kicked out of her caucus yeah. by her, Mr. Speaker. She wasn't kicked out of a progressive conservative caucus for the views that she held. She was kicked out Order. of the NDP caucus because of the Order. views that she held. Yeah. Perhaps she didn't want to be compelled, like the Leader of the Opposition is yeah. suggesting that she is doing to the rest of her members over there, Mr. Speaker. What we do on this Minister side of, of the Energy, House, progressive order. Conservatives, is stand up for all of the people of the province of Ontario. We don't sit on our benches compelling our members, Mr. Speaker. We stand up for everybody, no matter Order. where you come from, no matter what you believe in. We don't use this chamber Response. as a place to divide people, Mr. Speaker. That's not what responsible parliamentarians do. It is what she does, and she'll— Stop the clock. <laughs> members will please take their seats. The member for Ottawa South come to order. The government house leader come to order. Member for Ottawa South come to order. The government house leader come to order. The member for Ottawa South is warned. Start the clock. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. New government documents obtained by Global News reveal this government continues to underfund affordable housing. The Conservatives have cut funding to community housing programs, even though for a waitlist for an affordable home has ballooned to well over 65,000 people. My question is to the Minister. Why is this government cutting funding to affordable housing at a time when the housing and homelessness crisis has never been worse. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. In fact, we're not cutting funding for affordable housing. You know who's cutting funding? The Liberal NDP government in Ottawa. That is who's cutting funding by billions of dollars to the people of the province of Ontario. Now, this is an agreement that they signed in 2018 with the previous government that we have honoured. We have overachieved thanks to our, the, the actions that we have taken and our partnership with municipalities across the province of Ontario. 426 per cent of renovations have been completed under this government because we inherited a mess from the others. 11,000 of the 19,000 units that had to be built over 10 years were already there. But unilaterally, the NDP Liberal government in Ottawa has decided to cut billions of dollars from the people of the province of Ontario for affordable housing, Mr. Speaker. I asked the member opposite. They have an opportunity Response. to call their federal cousins in Ottawa and say that they will not support the federal budget unless the federal budget includes the restoration of the billions of dollars in funds that were unilaterally removed from affordable housing in Ontario. The member for Parkdale High Park, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The minister can spin all he wants and deflect blame, but documents reveal that this government is spending less on community housing and is making the homelessness crisis worse. The goal should be to prevent homelessness, which is better for people and costs less in the long run. Will the minister do the right thing and restore community housing funding? Minister Municipal Affairs and Housing. Do not have a clue of what they are talking about, Mr. Speaker. In the member's own riding, a 33 per cent increase in housing funding in the member's own riding, Mr. Speaker. You know who's done that? This government has done that. You know who voted against it? That member and that caucus. I guess they were compelled to vote against all of those initiatives. That's what happened, Mr. Speaker. There's one, one government that is opposed to affordable housing funding, and that is the federal government, the federal liberal and NDP government, who unilaterally, unilaterally decided to cut funding to the province of Ontario. Now, they didn't cut funding anywhere else, just Ontario. And you know who's staying silent? It is the NDP in Ottawa. They have an opportunity to vote against the federal budget Response. or to say, add 
the funding back in for the province of Ontario, and then they will support the budget. But they'll stay silent because they're just like the NDP here, irrelevant. Next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. People across this province and in Whitby are struggling with out of control costs due to the federal carbon tax. Shame. This tax is punishing hardworking families and costing them hundreds of dollars more than the rebates they receive. Speaker, it's unfair that the federal Liberals are making everything more expensive at a time when many Ontarians continue to face affordability concerns. But it seems like Justin Trudeau and his ally, Bonnie Crombie, don't care about reaching further into our pockets to achieve their own political objectives. Speaker, this has to come to end. Question. The carbon tax has to come to an end. Speaker, could the minister please explain what our government is doing to support the people of Ontario without Thank you. Carbon. Minister of Energy. Speaker, the member is right. We're not imposing a carbon tax in Ontario. As a matter of fact, we're giving the people of Ontario tax breaks at the pumps, 10.7 cents a litre until the end of this year. We're lowering taxes. We're lowering fees. And as a result, Mr. Speaker, we are seeing multi-billion dollar investments in our province. As a matter of fact, right now, the Premier is standing in Alliston, Ontario, announcing the largest investment in our country's history at the Honda plant, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing record investments, Mr. Speaker, multi-billion dollar investments. We have a plan for Ontario. It doesn't include a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Your mic's not on. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> Take your seat. <laughs> I'll remind the members not to make reference to the absence of another member. <laughs> Start the clock. Supplementary. Uh, thank you uh, to the minister for his response. Speaker, my constituents will be reassured to hear how our government is consistently introducing measures that provide tangible relief. Speaker, the hardworking people of this province are paying higher prices for everything because of the sky-high carbon tax. It's disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful, that the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberal caucus support a tax grab that punishes hardworking families Question. and local businesses. Speaker, they must come to their senses now and join our government in calling for an end to this disastrous tax. Can the minister please? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll take a seat. The Minister of Energy can reply. Speaker, we have not introduced a carbon tax in Ontario. As a matter of fact, we have fought the carbon tax all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, the queen of the carbon tax, the leader of the Liberals, combined with the NDP, they want to have the highest carbon tax in the world, Mr. Come Speaker. To order. We have a plan called Powering Ontario's Growth, and the Premier announced this morning the largest investment in Canada's history in Ontario, a $15 billion investment in Alliston at the Honda plant. That's on top of the multi-billion dollar investments in what were previously the largest investments in Canadian history at Volkswagen in St. Thomas and LG Stellantis in Windsor and the Umacore plant in Loyalist Township, Mr. Speaker. We have seen 45 billion dollars of investment in Response. Ontario's EV and EV supply chain because our plan is working. It's called Powering Ontario's Growth. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Hi, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario's housing crisis has become beyond parity. An Airbnb owner says she posted three tents in a room as a joke, but people are so desperate that the joke has become a reality. $720 a month for a tent in a shared room. But hey, they come with their own lock. 
I call this hitting rock bottom. Can the Premier tell me whether these three tents will count as affordable housing homes or one tent will be uh, counted as the affordable housing under his own strategy? Three. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, I, I mean, I don't actually have to answer a question. You know why? Because every question they ask just highlights how bad a party and how irrelevant they are to the discussion in the province of Ontario. Let's look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. They had one Order. premier, one premier, Bob Ray, in their history. He was so embarrassed to be an NDP member, he fled the party. Right? <laughs> Some of the best relations I have right now. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Of the NDP, who is now the mayor of Hamilton, who is telling me that she loves working with this government because we're getting things done, Mr. Speaker. And it's not just her. It's the former leader of the Liberal Party in Vaughan who tells me that the housing crisis started under the Member Liberal for government Hamilton and Mountain. that we Come are to order. finally taking action to get more homes built across the province of Ontario. Mr. Response. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ignore the most irrelevant party in the history of the province of Ontario and work for the people. Order. Supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. If denying solutions to the housing crisis was an Olympic sport, this Conservative government will be setting new records with their performance and denials. Just a week ago, just a week ago, a landlord in the Premier's own Etobicoke riding placed an advertisement renting out half of his bed. The kindest thing that I can say about this posting, Speaker, is that this landlord is at least making more housing than this government. <laughs> but this is just another serious story that Ontarians are living with because this Order. government is refusing to bring back real rent control. Will Order. the Premier restore real rent control, or is he simply satisfied that more Ontarians will just rent out half of their beds to desperate tenants in order to respond to the housing affordability crisis? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. Let's, uh, let's unpack that question. For rent control, right? So, who is the party that invented removing rent controls from new purpose built rentals? It was the NDP. It was the NDP under Bob Ray and the NDP Minister of Housing. Now, Order. who was Order. a chief of staff in that NDP government? Could it have been the leader of the opposition? So I'll tell you what, I'll take the good advice of and ask the minister to address the chair. I will continue to take the good advice from the leader of the opposition. We are breaking records. We're breaking records on new purpose-built rental housing. Ever, Mr. Speaker, more than Order. ever before. The most new housing starts over the Response. last three years than we have had in over 30 decades. I'll continue breaking those records every single day. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Before the previous Liberal government took office in Ontario in 2003, Ontario was regist registering 85,000 housing starts per year. But then after the Liberals took office in 2004, that rate fell below 80,000 units per year, and it never came back until the Liberals were thrown out of office. Speaker, the housing supply crisis that we inherited was a result of the failures of the previous Liberal government, supported, of course, by the NDP. And now the Liberals, under the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, supporting the federal Liberal carbon tax, which is a tax driving up the price of everything, Question. including housing. Can the minister please tell us how our government is building more homes and delivering for Ontario and fighting the carbon tax? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member from Essex for that question. As we all know, the carbon tax that's been inflicted upon us is hurting the cost of building houses throughout this province. But even still, in the last three years, we've built more homes in the 1980s, and even more importantly, um, we've set a record 27 percent last year increase in purpose-built rentals. Um, but let's look at another fact. 
Uh, in the last five and a half years, we've built more purpose-built rentals than in the entire 15 years of the Liberal government. And we're going to do more. We're going to pave the way for more houses to be built. We've lowered the HST on purpose-built rentals. We've lowered development charges, and we are investing in massive infrastructure, billions of infrastructure, right across this province to get shovels in the ground faster. But when I talk to modular home builders, they complain about the cost of transportation to get from A to B, their homes, the carbon tax. And the supplementary question, back to the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the minister for that response. Despite the challenges imposed by the federal Liberal carbon tax, our government is delivering on our commitment to build more homes in Ontario. The carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberals, on the other hand, are propping up their federal buddies in Ottawa with a pricey carbon tax every step of the way. Speaker, Ontarians are already struggling to make ends meet, and this regressive tax is only adding strain to their household budgets. We know that in order to provide more affordability and more housing solutions, our government must continue to show leadership by undertaking robust efforts to build thriving communities across the province. Can the minister please explain how the Liberal carbon tax is making it Question. more expensive to build houses in Ontario? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you again for the member of Essex. Mass timber construction, Speaker, is an innovative technique that has the potential to lower our carbon footprint while building more housing in Ontario. It's sustainable, it's energy efficient, and it lowers our carbon footprint. I'm proud that our government is expanding the use of mass timber construction. Yes. However, mass timber buildings, mass timber materials are heavy. They need to be transported, and guess what hurts that transportation cost? cost carbon tax. Yep. We need to get rid of the tax. Speaker, building mass timber uses 50 per cent less carbon than building with steel. Let's axe this tax. Let's make it affordable for all Ontarians to get into the housing market. Axe the tax. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Conservative government continues to underfund the education system. With inflation, per student funding has fallen by $1,357. When school funding doesn't keep up with inflation, school boards struggle to offer special education and supports for children with higher needs. For example, the Rainbow District School Board in Sudbury has an almost $19 million shortfall. Kel's one of the students in Sudbury that's being hurt by these Conservative cuts. Kel's in kindergarten. He has autism. And because there's not enough school board funding, Kale can't get the supports he needs to be safe and successful at his school. My question, Speaker, is why is the school funding so low that schools can't support students like Kale? Good question. Member for Burlington and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it was the previous Liberal government propped up by the NDP who cut half a billion dollars in education funding while calling it savings. This included special education funding. For the 2023-24 school year, we've invested over $3.4 billion for special education, the highest investment ever in Ontario history. This represents $125 million more million compared to the 2022-23 school year and nearly $541 million more than the 2017-2018 school year. We are the government that is ensuring equal access to top quality education in Ontario. Under this Premier, our government continues to make record Response. investments to support the next generation of Ontario leaders, including those with special needs. Okay. Conservatives talk about dollar amounts because they don't want to admit that they're not keeping up with inflation. Mm -hmm. yeah. $1,357 less per student under this Conservative government. Right. Kale's parents are working tirelessly to get their son the sports he needs to be safe and successful. They've already been waiting for years on the Ontario Autism Program wait list. They've already been paying out of pocket for autism supports for Kale. On top of those financial burdens they're paying because of this government, Kale's parents are trying to find a school with the supports Kale needs. There's not enough funding to provide the support at Kale's current school. There's not enough funding to enroll Kale at the closest next school. 
Will the Premier explain to Kale's family why there's not enough funding to support Kale? And the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Our government continues to make record investments to support the next generation of Ontario students, including those with special needs. We've announced a three-year program backed by $6.2 million in targeted supports for students with disabilities to pursue cooperative education ed opportunities. It's a pilot program designed to connect students with special needs to good-paying jobs. We've also increased funding for the behavioral expertise amount to $39 million Order. for the 2023-2024 school year, and we are providing $10 million in investment for the summer of 2024 to provide transition programs and additional staffing for students with special education needs over the summer months. Our government is providing historic investments into education to Response. ensure that students get back to basics, learn the foundations of reading, writing, and math, and prepare for the jobs of tomorrow. Order. 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 The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems the Minister of Education wants kids in this province to use their imagination when it comes to improvements and funding for their own schools. The TDSB has been left far behind in this government's recent budget. The largest school board in Canada is facing a deficit of $26.5 million for the upcoming year, and this government has no interest in helping them with capital funding. Sensational Seacord Elementary in East York is in desperate need of the new build promised ages ago. Parents are coming to me wondering how their premier is doubling the salaries of his staff and ballooning his office budget while their public schools are crumbling under the pressures of overstuffed classrooms, dilapidated infrastructure, and a complete lack of priorities by this government. My question, Speaker, is why is the TDSB getting shortchanged, and when can the Seacourt community expect their long-promised new school? And the response? The member for Burlington and parliamentary. Thank you, Speaker. It's incredibly clear that TDSB lacks the capacity to manage their budget and prioritize services for students in the schools from kindergarten to grade 12. Our government has increased base funding by $700 million just this school year alone, investing over $26.7 billion, the largest ever in Ontario's education history. TDSB student enrollment decreased by about 4% from 2019 to 2020, while at the same time their per-pupil funding has increased by 8.7%. Wow. After running a series of deficits over the last 20 years and increasing school board staffing on the Sunshine List, the TDSB should focus on prioritizing students and stop subsidizing services for non-public school <laughs> students. The supplementary question, back to the member for Beaches East York. It seems the gravy train has not been stopping at Danforth GO Station, Speaker. This major mobility hub at Maine and Danforth is considered an MTSA, and although we will be waiting until the cows come home before the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing finally signs off on those, there are 7,200 residential units being proposed. So I have to, uh, for a moment, uh, remind the member for Beaches East York that the supplementary question needs to follow uh, with regard to the subject that she raised in the initial question, and it's, she can't introduce a s totally separate subject, so it has to be re make reference to the original question. Keep order. So, speak. Oh, stop the call. Come on. Government side, come to order. Order. We start the clock. Member for Beaches East York. So, with the 7,200 new residential units in this, yes, in my backyard neighborhood, this government has not had the foresight to invest in local schools. This sure. new residents live. Maybe this government. Maybe this government Order. actually needs to go back to school themselves to study up on logic. Currently, Seacord is 200 school students beyond capacity. Question. With the largest speaker, when will this government put their money where their mouth is and actually get the shovels on the ground and build Seacord's new school? <laughs> 
Member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Our government more than doubled the amount to build schools, from $550 million a year ago to $1.3 billion this year, a 136 per cent increase. This, this funding will support 60 new projects just this year alone, creating over 27,000 school spaces. Over 10 years, our government is investing $16 billion in capital grants, which will support new schools for students in high growth areas, improve the condition of existing schools, and implement our new plan for childcare in schools. Under our plan, schools are being built. They're being built faster, efficiently, and effectively so that students have increased access to a place to learn and prepare for the jobs of tomorrow. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Oh. The carbon tax is not just increasing our energy. It's, it isn't just increasing our energy and gas bills. It's also driving up the cost of food, housing, and more. And that's unacceptable to Ontarians who are already struggling to make ends meet. Speaker, we know that the NDP and Liberals in this House will not stand up for their constituents. Instead, they are choosing to do nothing and watch this terrible tax triple by 2030. Their inaction is exactly why our government will not stop advocating for Ontario workers and families. We will continue to call on the federal Liberals to put a stop to this disastrous carbon tax. Speaker, Question. could the minister please explain what steps our government is taking to keep costs down for Ontario families? The Minister of Energy can reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're opposed to the federal carbon tax, as all premiers across Canada have done, Mr. Speaker, of all political stripes. They're opposed to Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh and Bonnie Crombie's uh, federal carbon tax. The queen of the carbon tax is happy to support that federal carbon tax, which went up a whopping 23 per cent on April 1st, Mr. Speaker. But we're lowering the price of gasoline by 10.7 cents a litre. We're cutting taxes. We're cutting fees. We're ending tolls. We're bringing in one fare so transit riders can save up to $1,600 a year, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. We're powering Ontario's growth with clean, reliable electricity by investing in our nuclear facilities, our hydroelectric facilities, building other new non-emitting generation. And as a result, Mr. Speaker, the plan, it's working. It's working. While Response. manufacturers were headed south of the border six years ago under the previous Liberal government, they're coming back in droves, including an historic $15 billion Honda investment today. Supplementary question back to the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. The federal carbon tax is hurting people in my riding of Newmarket Aurora and across this great province. I hear it every time I go door knocking. The Liberal carbon tax is driving up inflation and increasing the cost of essential items like groceries and transportation. Speaker, it's perplexing how the Liberals and the NDP in this House, after hearing a widespread frustration towards this tax grab can sit here and still support the federal carbon tax. Shame. Unlike the opposition, our government will always support the people of Ontario. We will persist in urging the federal government to abolish this regressive measure. Speaker, Far would the minister please explain to the House why it's imperative for the federal government to terminate this costly tax? Member. <laughs> minister of Energy. Speaker, just imagine uh, what we could do in Ontario and across the country without this federal carbon tax that's layering cost over cost at the pumps in your natural gas home heating in uh, the grocery store bill, Mr. Speaker. We're layering costs on top of costs, making it 
more expensive for the people of Canada and for the people of Ontario. In spite of all that, our plan, powering Ontario's growth, led by Premier Ford, led by our Minister of Economic Development and our entire team, have brought historic investments to our province. The Honda announcement made this morning is the largest in Canadian history—$15 billion. That Honda Accord, Mr. Speaker, in partnership with our federal and civic partners, is piloting a new direction for Ontario, putting us back on top as the economic engine, not just of Canada, but of North America, Response. Mr. Speaker. We all in this House should be celebrating that kind of an achievement today. $15 billion. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Across Ontario, too many students are not getting high-quality, effective French immersion because of our teacher shortage. There are French immersion classes being filled by teachers who speak no French. Others are experiencing turnover of four or five teachers in a single year. Learning French is important for employment opportunities, for cultural appreciation, and mutual understanding between Anglophones and Francophones. But you can't learn French if your teacher doesn't speak French. Speaker, When will we actually see serious, long-term solutions so that every child in Ontario who wants to learn French has the opportunity. The uh, member for Burlington and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. The Francophone community remains an integral part of Ontario's socio-economic fabric. Our government is taking action to tackle a decade-long French teacher shortage inherited from the previous Liberal, Liberal government propped up by the NDP. We're working with French language education partners to implement our four-year $12.5 million French teacher recruitment and retention strategy. We're funding an additional 110 language teacher education spaces for the 2023-2024 year. Our government remains unwavering in its commitment to support the Francophone community while continuing to invest our plan to further recruit and retain highly qualified French language educa educators in Ontario. The supplementary question, the member for Nickelback. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Dans le système de scolaire francophone, ce n'est pas mieux. 6 des professeurs ne sont pas qualifiés. 6 are not qualified. The number of inscriptions continues. We need at least 1,000 new teachers in French each year over the next five years, but this government is financing only 500 per year. Why is the government not interested in the success of young French-speaking Ontarians? Member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Our government remains committed to a francophone community and francophone education in the province of Ontario. Over 10 years, our government is investing $15 billion in capital grants, which will support new schools for students in high growth areas, improve the conditions of existing schools, and implement our new plan for childcare in schools. This includes approximately $1.4 billion for the 2023-24 school year to support the repair and renewal of schools. Our government remains committed to the Francophone community to ensure that they continue to prosper in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is uh, for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Uh, in March, Bill 153, the Building Infrastructure Safety Act uh, 2024 received a royal assent. Uh, the importance of this legislation cannot be overstated. Ontario, one cause identification of underground infrastructure is a necessary safety measure in construction, and this industry greatly contributes to the growth of this province. To meet the demands of our modern economy, the government must ensure that services effectively and safely reach the people and businesses of Ontario. So, Speaker, I understand that on May 1st, some regulations from this new legislation will come into force. Can the minister please explain to the people of Ontario Question. what is on the way and how these regulations will help Ontario grow safely? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Mississauga East Cooksville for the appropriate and timely question. 
On Wednesday, May 1st, two new regulations will come into effect under the Building Infrastructure Safely Act, and they will enable one call to better locate underground infrastructure and streamline delivery processes to cut down on the number of locates needed on a job site. Large excavation projects will now be able to request a locate 10 business days prior to their intended dig, and this helps with timelines and streamlining projects. Ontario One Call will also be given the power to impose administrative penalties, but they will do so with this new enforcement tool only when necessary. These changes will help keep construction costs down, Mr. Speaker, Response. and are just an ex one example of how our government is delivering on vital infrastructure like transit, building homes, and building roads and infrastructure, ensuring public safety. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the minister for his response. I'm glad to see that the government is delivering on its promise to safely build the infrastructure Ontario needs uh, for the future. Speaker, many of my constituents in the riding of Mississauga East Cooksville have come to me expressing concerns over issues relating to door-to-door -door sales. Uh, we must remain committed to protecting consumers from unfair practices, aggressive sales tactics, and misleading claims. Uh, this new legislation, Better for Consumers, Better for Businesses Act of 2023, is providing Consumer Protection Ontario with new powers to enforce consumer protection law. So, Speaker, can the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery elaborate on when Ontario consumers can expect to see changes come into effect. Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another thoughtful and timely question from the member. Our goal has always been to better protect Ontarians. We heard that in our first mandate and embarked on a 15-year review of consumer protection uh, that was neglected for 15 years. Rather, we embarked quickly on it, and in this term, introduced and this House unan unanimously passed the Better for Consumers, Better for Businesses Act. We are now in the regulatory phase. We are listening and consulting. We will address further issues around door-to-door -door sales, direct contracts, and we will engage to ensure that our modern marketplace aligns with new consumer behaviours and the digital world. From the beginning, a progressive Conservative government introduced legislation on consumer protection, the first in the country in 1966. A progressive Conservative government did it again in 2002, and a progressive Conservative Response. government is doing it again in 2024 on behalf of all the people of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Chatham-Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The Liberal carbon tax continues to make life more unaffordable for the people of Ontario. It's driving up prices and making life more expensive on everything from grocery bills to the cost of filling up our cars. But, Speaker, it goes well beyond that. The carbon tax scheme is negatively impacting the very people who have a critical role in building our province. The carbon tax is increasing the costs for building materials and the transportation of these materials, adding significant burden for the home builders of Ontario. It's not right. The people in Chatham Kent Leamington and across Ontario who dream of home ownership should not be punished by the federal carbon tax scheme. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the Liberal carbon tax is making it more expensive Question. to build housing in Ontario? Question. Question. The parliamentary assistant and member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the great member from Chatham Kent Leamington for that great question. As the members know, our government is taking an all hands approach, ensuring that we're getting shovels in the ground and increasing our housing supply, Speaker. But the federal Liberal carbon tax is hurting these efforts. Speaker, let me paint a picture for everyone in this place today. When our men and women in our forestry industry go into the forests in the north to cut down that tree for a two-by-four, they use gas and fuel in their chainsaws. Carbon tax. When the forest equipment takes that log out of the forest, speaker, carbon tax. When the trucker takes that log to the mill to be processed, carbon tax. When the mill processes that log into two-by-fours, carbon tax. There's a theme here. When that truck takes that log the uh, two by four to the home hardware or the Home Depot, carbon tax. And when the contractors come to pick up that two by four, carbon tax. That is seven times, Speaker, just right there. When will this when will the opposition stand up here? 
The supplementary question, Dr. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to our parliamentary assistant for that response. It's encouraging to see how our government, unlike the NDP and Liberal members in this House, are supporting families and individuals across Ontario and fighting back against the Liberal carbon tax. Speaker, in the middle of a housing crisis, this tax grab is impacting every person looking to buy a home. Home builders in Chatham Kent Leamington and Essex County have told me personally this carbon tax is dramatically increasing the price to transport building materials. This is truly devastating to young families, hoping to enter the housing market and seeing prices go well above what they can afford. The federal Liberals need to get and do the right thing and scrap this tax today. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please share how this Liberal carbon tax scheme is increasing prices Question. of new homes across Ontario? For Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to my friend from Chatham Kent Leaming for, for that supplementary question. As the member mentioned, the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, oh. may think a 23% increase in April 1st was an April Fool's joke, Speaker, but Ontario families are not laughing. Speaker, as I mentioned in my earlier response, carbon tax is on everything in your house, on the 2 by 4 on the drywall, on the barbecue in your backyard, and on that food you put on the barbecue in the backyard, Speaker. Speaker, not only did Bonnie Crombie have an abysmal housing start record in the last month that she was mayor, she supports increasing the cost of building materials for our homes, increasing the cost on the gas of our construction workers building those homes, and increasing everything that goes into a home. When will the independent Liberals get in their minivan, go to Ottawa, and demand that the federal Liberal government scrap this? Members will take their seats. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Order. House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Um, when we talk about free, prior, informed consent, we cannot boast about having a full supply chain of EVs in Ontario without the free, prior, informed consent of First Nations where the minerals are. Can this government confirm that you have the free, prior informed consent of all First Nations in the North for mining for EVs? Members will please take their seats. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The, the member uh, knows uh, quite well that uh, we have been a minister and the, and the premier. Uh, have been working very closely with uh, First Nations uh, because we understand how important it is to unlock the resources of the North to power not only the economies of Northern Ontario but to help uh, empower empower the uh, the, uh, the manufacturing might of Southern Ontario. That is why we are working very closely uh, with uh, First Nations partners in that area who have told us that they want to be partners in helping unlock uh, these uh, these resources uh, for all Ontarians and for. Uh, First Nations communities. That is why we are taking enormous steps to ensure that every community in, in Northern Ontario is uh, no longer using diesel generation, for instance. I know the Minister of Energy has ensured that uh, I think almost every community now will be hooked up to the grid to help us to help us support uh, what we are Response. doing uh, in, uh, in Northern Ontario. And the member is very, is absolutely correct. First Nations are going to be partners with us in getting this done, and I look forward to that continuing collaboration. Supplementary, the member for Kiwetna. Uh, speaker, uh, I know uh, I, I, I know for a fact that this government remains well short of the First Nations partnership and permissions, Speaker, that it needs to fulfill the Ring of Fire mining aspirations. The fact is that most of Northern Ontario's uh, minerals are years, if not decades away from powering any EVs. Speaker, my question to the minister. Has the minister personally met with the leadership 
and the rights holders of these lands impacted by the Ring of Fire. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, I, I know that the, the, the member opposite would know that the Minister, uh, both uh, uh, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and the Mi Minister of Mines, uh, has been uh, doing uh, just uh, just that. I know that the Minister of Indigenous Affairs has uh, has worked very closely with First Nations partners to ensure that uh, that we uh, not only uh, work with First Nations, and we're we're being told, really, frankly, we're hearing from so many partners, not only in, in Northern Ontario, but partners from across uh, the province, who say they want to participate in helping us build an economic uh, powerhouse, rebuild the economic powerhouse that was the province of Ontario, and that no community wants to be left behind, Mr. Speaker. And it is so vitally important that uh, that our partners in First Nations communities are a part of that. They want to be a part of that, and we're going to continue to work very hard. I I know it's a priority of the Premier, I Response. know it's a priority of the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, and I know how hard the Minister of Mines has been working to ensure that we get that because we can't power the South, we can't power the North unless we unlock the riches of Ontario. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. The Liberal carbon tax is pushing families and businesses in my riding of Thornhill and across the entire province to their limits. Ontario has to pay more for their daily necessities, from their grocery bills to filling their cars at the gas pump, and I did that just the other night. And Speaker, with this month's 23 per cent hike, Ontarians are justifiably concerned about the impact this will have on our public safety system. Public safety is such a top priority for communities, and it's essential that our first responders have the tools they need to keep people safe. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain the negative impacts of the carbon tax on law enforcement and public safety agencies across Ontario? And to reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend from Thornhill for that question. And I want to thank Chief Jim McSween and the amazing people at the York Regional Police Service that keep York Region safe every day. And it's undeniable, as much as this government is doing everything we can to graduate more people at the Ontario Police College, to fight auto theft because we're in a crisis with people stealing our cars, to get those violent and repeat offenders off our street, we have a carbon tax that's affecting public safety. Jim, Chief Jim McSween will say that to fill up every car at YRP costs a lot of money. That money could put more boots on the ground. And Bonnie Crombie knows this. The Liberal Party knows this. It's time they do Fonts. the right thing, call their friends in Ottawa and say, it's affecting the public safety of Ontario. Scrap the tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for his response and for his dedicated work for the province. It's encouraging to hear that our government is supporting our vital first responders and calling on the federal Liberals to scrap the tax. The same can't be said for the NDP and the independent Liberal members in this House as they choose to side with this unjust tax grab. With media reports about criminal activities in communities across this province, people in my riding want to make sure that our frontline police officers have the support they need to carry on their duties. They are concerned that the Liberal carbon tax is placing a strain on policing budgets. Our hardworking police officers deserve to have the resources they need to respond to emergencies so that Ontarians can live safely in their communities. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please elaborate on how the carbon tax is negatively, uh, negatively impacting the police services? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank my friend for the question. It's one thing that the proxies for the Liberals and the NDP tried to sink the police service budget in Toronto, in Ottawa, in Hamilton, and in London. It's unbelievable. And they knew that in addition to trying to sink the budget, they were affecting public safety. But what makes matters worse is that Bonnie Crombie served on the board of Peel Police Service. She knew the budget. She knew it's undeniable that the carbon tax is affecting every fill-up of a vehicle to keep Peel safe. 
And do you know what, Mr. Speaker? In spite of that, in spite of that, she will not come clean with Ontarians and say, I know this, it's affecting public safety. I will do something about it. And I'll tell Response. people I'm against it because she's in favour of it and everyone knows it. The next question. The member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. In 2022, the government threw the vehicle registration system into disarray, but instead of cleaning up their mess, they decided to double down and eliminate vehicle registration entirely. Now, there's a spike in vehicle thefts. Coincidence? Not so much. In 2023, a billion dollars was lost in Ontario alone. Thieves are exploiting this loophole to sell stolen vehicles to unsuspecting Ontarians. Car thefts are so high, police are telling people to keep their car keys close to the front door. Will this government help police identify stolen vehicles by re-implementing vehicle registration? Mr. General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's no government in the history of Ontario that has taken public safety as serious as our government led by Premier Ford. And whether we're fighting to keep the violent and repeat offenders off our streets, graduating a record number of cadets at the Ontario Police College, or fighting auto theft, we worry about this day and night, and we do something about it. And that's why we've invested $51 million through grants throughout Ontario to fight auto theft. We will do everything we can to fight auto theft, Mr. Speaker, and I'll tell you why. Because we have a right to live safe in our own homes and communities and not be subject to people who think they can knock down our doors and demand our keys. It's completely unacceptable, and we're not going to stand for it. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote next.